Man, it's good to be with you guys. So good. Um, I'll start us right off with a verse out of Romans chapter 6. It's going to be a little theological, but there's a core I want you guys to get. Uh, Romans 6, verse 1. This is Paul talking. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, if you're like me, you read a verse like that and you're like, what just happened, Paul? Like there's a lot going on there in that verse. Let me just say it this way. What he's saying is that if you've become a Christian and you've been saved by grace, like this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You could, after that salvation, say, well, if God is gonna forgive me and save me and love me no matter what, Maybe I just keep going and living my own life the way I want to, and he'll just keep forgiving me, right? It becomes license. And he's like, by no means. This is not what Christians are called to do. Amen? Amen. Come on, second service. I'm going to. No way. He says, the way this actually worked is that when you came to Jesus, and he kind of uses baptism as a picture here. Your old life died and it went under the water and it was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. Are your old agendas and your old selfishness and your old destruction and everything, everything that was about you, that was all supposed to die. And you raised up out of the water. You were raised to life, to a new life, a life that is lived according to Jesus's way. That's the way that it's supposed to work. Amen. Uh, Last several weeks. I've hit you with this phrase, God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. Right? We struggle with that. God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's not just get, get saved and then live your own life. God actually expects us to follow the way of Jesus, to walk in the character of Jesus. And that expectation is actually God's love for us and it's his kindness because he's not leaving us where we are. It's okay to not be okay. Right, like we come through the doors this morning as broken people, messed up people. Anybody, just me? Like, right? Like, that's, that's who we are. Like, a lot of times we're like, we're walking in, we're kind of wearing the, the church mask, hoping nobody notices just how broken we are, how bad it was in the car on the way over here. Right, like all of the stuff. I get it. It's okay to not be okay. But the Father in heaven loves you too much to leave you there. Yes. He won't leave you in your broken, sinful, destructive place. And so he's constantly calling us out because a parent who really loves their kids does not want them to say that selfish, self-centered child. Yes, calls them out. And so he calls us out. And so God does not exempt us from following Jesus. He does not pre-excuse us from following Jesus and saying, we all know how hard this is. Why even try? God doesn't do that. He calls you out instead. And he knows you're going to fail and he knows you're going to need forgiveness and he knows you're going to need amazing grace all over again. You're absolutely going to need all of that. He's going to have to pick you back up because you're not going to be able to pick yourself back up. Yes. You need all the grace all the time, every single day of your life, not just at salvation. Absolutely, but he still expects. And his expectation is love for us. I love that he expects. Last week, we had a very, very special time here at the front stage. Were you here for it? We had a rededication service. We don't have these very often, but we had a rededication service. And we talked about surrendering everything that we are back to God. And you guys flooded this, this front area here, all three services. It was, it was absolutely miraculous. We were kind of in a God moment here. God is drawing near. Did you know God draws near sometimes? Like God is always here, but sometimes he draws near in a special way. He's been drawing near in a special way for our church. And so we, we had all kinds of like tears going, all kinds of joy and smiles going and hugs going last week as people kind of came to this new realization of just how broken they were and how much they need God all over again. And isn't that a, a miraculous place to be? It's weird. <laughs> you can come to this space where the Holy Spirit just wrecks you and helps you to understand just how much you've been blowing it. And you can have the biggest smile on your face while it happens. You're like, well, that's paradoxical. Yes, it is. Here's why. It's because you're finally getting free. 
It's because the illusion you've been living under, that you're this really good Christian person who's got it all figured out and you don't need anything else, that's actually burdensome to you. That's actually been weighing you down and keeping you stuck. And so when the shackles finally come off and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm wrecked again, just like I was in the very beginning, all of a sudden the smiles come, amen? And all of a sudden the tears come. God is so good. Last, last week was just so good for so many of us. Um, some people wrote me just kind of a flood of notes and letters and, and testimonies. And um, I'll just share just a couple of them with you. Uh, one said that, that uh, grace is becoming a place where people take huge steps of surrender to God. And they see that, get, giving up their old lives. Another person said that they were personally remembered of the standard to which we are called as Christians and that they had forgotten that standard and they had forgotten that that standard actually mattered. Amen. And only God can speak that to us. Another person said they heard the firm voice of God speaking to them saying, it's time for you to walk the walk. And they asked, how do I walk the walk? Today's message is going to be about how do we walk the walk? How to. Another person said, I was holding on to sin and God finally opened my eyes. And they said, we, we did this list last week. What are the things that you love most about Jesus? They said, what I love most about Jesus is that still quiet voice who speaks truth to me that changes me. Yeah, God has been drawing near. Is that good? So if you're, if you're asking what that person was asking me, after rededication, okay, I've had this big moment. What do I do now? How do I walk the walk? Because the title of the series is Coasting. I don't want to coast anymore. Anybody? I don't want to coast anymore. I've done it. How do I do this life without the coasting? And, and what I would say to you is that the spiritual walk is gradual. And it's lifelong. And it's not the big obvious moments. At least it's not just the big obvious moments, right? Like your salvation and your, your baptism and, and you go to a Christian concert and, and, and get all fired up and make a big decision or you go to a conference or something like that. And sometimes we can get stuck in this place of thinking that the Christian life in its entirety is those obvious moments. And then we wait around for the next one to happen. The Christian life is not just the, like those are wonderful, right? Yeah. Like those are gifts of God when they happen. Like God does come and he does draw near and he does wake us up and he fills us with new life. And we absolutely need those moments. They're awesome, but that's not the totality of the Christian life. And you can't wait around just for the next one. You got to walk the walk every day. What if your marriage was just the anniversaries and the Valentine's days? Right? Like, they're good, but it's all the in-betweens, yes? Like, that's what makes a marriage healthy, and it's the same with you and Jesus. You have to live the discipleship life. If the, if the 11 remaining apostles were standing here right now, and you ask them, how do we walk the walk with Jesus? They would say, live the life of a disciple. Live the life that Jesus called us to. So how do we do that? 2 Peter 1.4 talks to us about this. And because of his glory and excellence, so this is one of the apostles right here, Peter. Because of Jesus' glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. So when he says the great and precious promises, he means the gospel there. He means the fact that you are saved in Christ and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Do you know how broken you are? Oh my gosh, man. Like we're so broken. Like, like I'm the one who broke my family. I'm the one who broke my community. I'm the one who broke my church. I'm the one who adds darkness through my own selfishness and my own self-centeredness to every single relationship every single day. Like I'm up here as a pastor telling you, I didn't used to sin, I still sin. Does that challenge you? I am not yet perfect. Amen. Amen. <laughs> like I am still blowing it. And the more I blow it today, the more I realize how much I blew it then. Absolutely. But it's like all of that broke me and broke this world. It's my responsibility. And not only is it my responsibility, but it broke me and God. 
And I couldn't put me and God back together again. And all the religions of the world want to come along and they want to tell you, this is how you put you and God back together again. You increase your moral successes and eventually your moral successes will outweigh your sins. And once you do enough good, you might gain entrance into heaven. And some of you are still pursuing that and chasing that and hoping for that. And that is not the Christian gospel. Amen. The Christian gospel is that the sin in your life was so bad that divinely speaking, you deserved capital punishment. Jesus took capital punishment on for you. And he died for you, for real. And when he died for you, that means you don't have to die anymore. And if you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ and say, I'm not gonna rely on me anymore. I'm gonna rely on you, God, and I'm gonna rely on what you've done. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, the gift of Jesus on the cross for you, not by works so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Like that's the gospel and that's supposed to wreck us. Because it puts us in a spot where we, we know we're absolutely broken people, but we're absolutely loved. And that gives us freedom. And it gives us freedom to change. So, okay, so from here on out, here's how I'm going to do this message, the end of this message. I'm going to talk to people who've given their life to Jesus. Because that guy who asked me, how do I walk the walk? The rest of this message is a talk to him. It's like we're, Two of us are at a coffee shop and I'm just gonna explain this. I'm not gonna try to sell it. I'm not gonna try to inspire you. I'm not gonna try to tell you why. I'm gonna assume that you know Jesus and have surrendered to him and you wanna know how to do this thing. Now, if you're not surrendered to Jesus yet, I'm glad you're here. Amen. You're listening in. God has you here for a reason. But some of these things are going to feel mysterious to you because you're not surrendered yet. Some of these things only start to make sense after you're surrendered. That's right. Come on. So I'm not going to, throughout the rest of the message, I'm not going to keep saying, if this applies to you, I'm just, I'm talking to that guy and the rest of us are listening in. Whew. So Peter says, these great and precious promises, they're going to change us into the character of Jesus and they're going to free us from this world. And then he's going to go and he's going to describe it more. Second Peter 1, 5, he says, supplement your faith. That means add to your faith. And what he's about to give us here in this list is the apostle Peter is going to say, here's how the Christian life grows from step to step, glory to glory, line on line, precept on precept. And he's going to start at the top with faith. And then he says, add or supplement to your faith a generous pr provision of moral excellence. So obey everything that God says. Check. Easy, right? <laughs> yeah, you were supposed to laugh. Good. Good. No, but this is the next thing is, is once we uh, know we're saved and, and we love God, like we're going to come to him and say, okay, tell me what to do. Right, like that's what a disciple does. And as you obey everything that God says, the next step then is, then you're gonna add knowledge. You're gonna add knowledge of God. You're gonna start to read and study the scripture. You're gonna start to seek God and, and you're gonna peer in and you're gonna wonder what the character of Jesus is actually like. Not just what you were told. You're gonna find out for yourself. Some of you were taught things as a kid and then you read the Bible for yourself as an adult and you were blown away by what it had to say about Jesus, Right? Like this is like be in your Bible and then you're going to add to your knowledge, self-control. That means you're going to start saying no to the things that bind you up, your hurts, your habits, your hangups, your addictions. You're going to start saying no to those things. You're going to sharpen your no and you're going to start having some self-control. That's growth, right? Another easy one. Yes. And then you're going to add to self-control patient endurance, which means you're going to be able to be patient when God calls you to wait. And that's hard. And you can be patient when other people in your life fail you to be patient with them and endure them and then add to that patient endurance godliness, which is when the whole thing starts to change your character deeply because you're doing all of these things as you do them one centimeter at a time, it starts to change you. 
It starts to shape you. You start to talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, think like Jesus. That's godliness. And then you're going to add to your godliness, brotherly affection, which for you Greek people, that's phileo, right? Like that's that brotherly love. Like you're going to take time out of your schedule. You're going to show practical love to people that you care about. That's brotherly love. And then once you get brotherly affection right, you're going to love everybody agape. Unselfish, I love everybody it's not about me, it's about them. Like that's, that's the pinnacle. But you see how Peter sees this as a progression. We don't all start with everything on day one, yes? How do I walk the walk? Well, Peter tells us. Peter tells us, it's a progression. In, in a sense, what I could do is say, here's how you walk the walk, just do this. This, Genesis to Revelation. Read it all, memorize it all, do it all. And I'd be right. Come on. On some level, that's what a disciple does. Is we want to know what God says, his revealed will. And we want to walk in his will. But you're laughing because you're like, oh, I've done that before. Or I've tried that before. Right? And it's tough stuff. Is that rain I hear? Man, it's coming down. That's good. That's good. I like that. Okay. Don't relax, you rain people, noise maker people. Don't relax. Edge of your seat. Come on. Okay. To walk the walk of a disciple, you're meant to live it. And one of the things that that means is stop opting out of things that God has told you to do. Stop opting out of things and giving yourselves excuses for things that God has clarified to you, you need to do, and you need to walk in, and you've let yourself off the hook in the past. You need to study God's word for real. If you're sitting at the coffee shop with me, and you want to know how to walk this walk, I'm just going to tell you, open up your Bible for real. Do it. How am I get busy? Don't be busy. Just don't be. Read a chapter a day at minimum. Start in Matthew 1. Start learning about Jesus and then keep going through the gospels and the rest of the New Testament. But you start reading God's word for real. Don't opt out. Start praying for real. Well, praying's hard. I know it's hard. And sometimes you don't know where to start. Here's a place to start. In the New Testament, it says, take your anxieties to the Lord and turn them into prayers. So the next time you pray, take your five top stresses in your life, write them down. Maybe your top 10 stresses in your life, write them down and start having a conversation with God about those stressors, about the things that you're afraid of, about the things that you long for. Just start talking to him about those things. But isn't there all this other kind of prayer? Yes, there is. And you can get books and you can get better, but start somewhere. Stop giving yourself excuses to not do it. Start talking to God. Start loving God for real. And some of you are sitting here and it's like, well, I'm just a church person. I just grew up. I'm just a church person. Don't. Don't just be a church person. Walk with Jesus. Like if you want to know why, if you want to know how to not coast, that's the title of the series, how to not coast in between all of the moments, walk with Jesus. For real. You're being really direct. I know it's on purpose. Give your money away. Be generous. Be generous. Like give your money to the church. Give your money away to the poor. Well, I think pastors are bad. That's fine. Don't give your money to me. I don't need it. Give it to somebody else. The point isn't that I get money. The point, or or the church, the point is that you get free from your greed. Like God built generosity into the Christian life so that you would slowly start to loosen your grip on what has a grip on you. Give your money away. Need to fix your marriage. You've known it for a long time. It's been getting more and more distant, more and more broken, more and more bitterness coming in, and you haven't faced it. And it's time to face it. How do I walk the walk of Jesus? Fix your marriage. Go to counseling. Get some books and actually read them. Have the hard conversations with your spouse. For real, face the stuff. Like you already know this. I'm just saying out loud what you already know, right? Like, it's me too, right? Like, the the Holy Spirit is so good. He's been whispering this stuff to us all along. We just keep opting out of it. We just keep giving ourselves excuses. No, it's like, go to the counseling. Well, the counseling costs money. Heck, yes, it costs money. So pay it. It's the foundation of your whole family. 
isn't it so worth it? Like sometimes people will say, well, I can't get off work in order to meet with the counselor at the time that the counselor gives us. What's weird is you find a way to get to the dentist office during his hours, or you get to the doctor during their hours, but you can't get to the counselor during their hours. Do you see what you're revealing about yourself? It's about priorities. It's about what it's worth to you. So do it. Just do it. Or people say, well, I met with a counselor five times and it didn't fix everything that we had broken over five years. You got five years to break it all. He only gets five sessions to fix it. Like, like we got to listen to ourselves here. Do the work. Get in community. I'm just church person. No, get into community. Like get, get with some people in the living room that know you and you're opening up the Bible together and you pray for each other. And you know each other's needs. And they actually, you give them the right to get into your life a little bit. That's going deeper. That's biblical. That's New Testament. That's the way the disciples did it. Oh, you need to serve people that are in need. Ricky talked about that at the beginning. Serve people that are in need. Well, who do I serve? Whoever the Holy Spirit tells you to serve. Amen. You want a courageous prayer? Go to God this afternoon and say, God, would you bring somebody into my life who I need to sacrifice time or money or effort for and watch the Holy Spirit rush to you. He'll show you who they are. Pray that courageous prayer. You are broken and you need to change and grow. What are you waiting for? Second Peter 1, 8. So he says then, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you should be growing. And if you are, then you will be productive, right? Like in spiritual fruit in your life, helping other people, helping the kingdom of God grow. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So Peter envisions in the first century, so take this in for a second, he envisions a whole lot of Christians might get saved and then never grow. Amazing that he saw that coming, amen? But he saw it and he's like, and if you fail to grow, you stop thriving, this is what went wrong. You forgot the gospel. Like I've killed some plants in my time. Have you killed plants before? Poor plants, right? <laughs> What's amazing is when you can keep a plant alive, <laughs> right? Um, and, and here's what I love about plants. Um, plants aren't like, like fix this car. I wouldn't even know where to start, right? There's so many things that could possibly go wrong. But a plant, it's either sunlight or it's water or it's dirt or it's nutrients, right? Like there's only so many things that could be wrong. You start tweaking those dials, you could probably keep a plant alive, maybe. So Peter comes in and he says, listen, if your Christian life isn't growing, there's one thing wrong. It's that you forgot the gospel. There's one thing wrong. And that is, you forgot that you were cleansed of your past sins, he said. See, that's powerful. Like, what could that mean? Well, maybe it means that back then I knew I was a broken person. And then really quickly, I didn't like thinking about that anymore. And I started considering myself a good religious church person. And once I had a new identity that I wrapped around myself, that I'm now a good person, then any indication about sin in my life that starts to come toward me, I refuse that stuff and ignore that stuff. And I don't let that stuff in anymore because I'm a good religious person. Peter's like, you forgot you're broken. And you're broken. And anytime the Holy Spirit comes along and whispers in your ear, that here's a new way I need to reveal to you you're broken today, all that stuff needs to come right in. Like you need to welcome it. it it's that joy, that weird, really weird joy that you feel as soon as God wrecks you. He's supposed to be able to wreck you all the time. And Peter says at some point you kind of built up this, I don't know, this protection, this wall around yourself where God can't wreck you anymore. I mean, part of what happened for some of us last week when we came forward and we made this big decision between us and God is that we hadn't been wrecked for a long time. Why is that? Had we stifled the voice of God in our lives? I think sometimes we do. 
sometimes we coast because we forget the gospel. Timothy Keller said, I am more sinful and flawed than I ever dared believe, yet at the same time, I am more loved and accepted in Christ than I ever dared hope. It's just a, a way to summarize the gospel for ourselves. He's constantly revealing to me how sinful and flawed I am, and I'm constantly losing clarity on that, and I need the clarity back. Anybody else? Yeah, you admitted it last week, and joy came. Sometimes, too, when we start to identify ourselves as a good person, uh, we start to take our rights back. If we do that, we talked about that last week a bit. Like, it's my house, my life, my schedule, my career, my dreams, right? Like, it's, it's, all that stuff is mine. But if you've been died for, if you've been saved in your sin... You have no rights. If you were headed toward hell and then Jesus rescued you by no good of your own, don't you owe him everything? And again, you got to stay in that place of, God, I have no rights anymore. Like I don't, it's all yours. Matthew 22, 35. One of them, an expert in the religious law, tried to trap Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? So some of you guys remember this story. So somebody goes to Jesus. This actually happened two or three times um, in the gospels. They go to Jesus and say, tell us what's the most important command. And, and, And that makes sense to us, right? Like the Bible is so big and there's so many things to do. Like walk with Jesus, just do all the stuff. It's like, where do I start? What am I supposed to do? Like, like somebody simplify me this for me. And so he goes and he asks Jesus this question, simplify, take all the laws. Like there's 613 of them in the Old Testament. What's the most important? And so Jesus tells him, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. Now, don't read past that. Realize what he's saying. Everything that you do must be love of God. Like it's the greatest and it's the first commandment. Jesus didn't have to say all that, by the way, but he's letting you know just how massive this is, that you actually love God. Well, we go to church. Do you go to church because you love God? Well, we worship and we raise our hands. Do you do it because you love God? Like that's massive. And then he goes on, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So don't just love your neighbor, love your neighbor like you love yourself. (coughs) The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. The entire law and all the prophets are based on these two commands. So, So again, he's saying more than the question actually asked him to say. He says, not only are they the first, not only are they the, the, they the most important, but these commands, they're the foundation for all the other commands. So some of your versions will use a different word there for, for depends there. I'll tell you the Greek word, and I, I absolutely um, uh, killed this first service. I didn't kill it in a good way. I, <laughs> I destroyed the word, murdered the word, something like that. Uh, <laughs> Kremonymi. Kremonimi is the word in the Greek. So that word there in yours that says depends on, kremonimi, it means to hang, to hang from. So the same word used later in the New Testament says Jesus hung from the cross. That's the word here. So Jesus is saying every single other law in all of the scripture hangs from these two. Love God and love people. So not only are they the the foundation, but if you don't have those two, there's nothing. Does that make sense? So here's here's a picture of Jake and I, Um, right? So this is a, we went to this father-son camp years ago, and this is a ride that they called the Screaming Eagle, and they would wrap you in like this weird taco and, and all the cables would go up somehow to a central point. And 
This is us down at the ground right before we went on. That's why we're smiling. And, uh, <laughs> and the next picture is that's us way up there. So they kind of crank you up like three or four stories high. And I mean, it's, it's nuts. And then you have to pull the release cable that just sends you swinging like crazy. And they call it the screaming eagle because when you're screaming, it's so masculine and manly. Um, <laughs> right? So, mm -hmm. anyway, without that holding us up, we're done. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying you can do all the other things in the Bible. Remember the Pharisees? You do them without love and there's nothing to hold them up. And they don't make sense. There's a spot in 1 Corinthians 15 it's, it's, or 13. It's talking about love and, and agape love. In it. And, and it says that, that if I give everything that I have away to the poor in my life, but don't have love, I have nothing. It says, if I understand all the mysteries in God's word, every single mystery, like I know it, I totally get it, but I have not love, then I am nothing. If I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, then I am nothing. And like, a few weeks ago, we were talking about martyrs, right? In the early church and people giving their lives away, like literally giving their lives away. And Paul's there in 1 Corinthians saying, you might give your life away, but if it's not with this motive, it means nothing. Because it's one thing to die, but to die because I love the Lord is different. And it changes everything. It changes everything and it's actually the thing that starts to help you grow. Some of you have white knuckled through Christianity and you have tried really, really hard and you have not changed. And you're like, why was all of that coasting when I was trying so hard? I would say because you were trying hard and you were not loving hard. Jesus calls us to love and to love others as ourselves. How is that even possible? Does he understand how self-centered I am? Has he thought about me lately? Because I know me. Like, like I am self-glorifying. I'm absolutely self-obsessed. In every single moment, it's always about me all of the time. Come on. Jesus just expects me to like be about other people or be about him. It's, it's an absolute mystery and it would be an absolute miracle if it could even happen. And the answer to all that is yes. God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. He expects us to do it. Like imagine how this would work. Like you would walk into the room and it's almost like you would peel your, this is, this is gross. Uh, but it's almost like you would peel your skin off and all your pain receptors and you would wrap it around another person. And you would say, how do they feel right now? What are they afraid of? What do they need? What brings them joy? And I would be obsessed with that idea at all times, obsessed with that idea. And Jesus is saying, if you could change your obsession from self-obsession to obsessed with other people and what they need, all of the sudden things would start to change. You wouldn't coast anymore. And if you could do that with God, oh, I'm not just coming to church to check a box anymore. I'm coming to church because I love Jesus. Amen. It's a very, very different thing. I knew a guy who had an affair on his wife. And I was early in ministry. And, and when it kind of came out and he was, he was caught, he came back to her. And he came into pastoral counseling and and he was saying all the right things, right? He was saying all the right things and all the right kind of repentance words and all this kind of stuff. And it went on for a few months and then he eventually gave it all up and he went back to uh, the other woman. And, and you're like, why? Because we try to change, but sometimes we don't change deeply. We try to change and we try to white knuckle and, and it doesn't work. And the thing is, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be humble here real quick. I don't have a spiritual x-ray on that man and know exactly what was in his heart. 
But my observation, my discernment on what was going on with him is that he wasn't changing for her. And he wasn't changing for God. He was changing and he was trying to change and he was white knuckling because he hated the consequences of his sin. He hated what it was costing him. And when you hate the consequences of what it's costing you, that's actually self-love. Do you see that? I hate what this is doing to me. I, I hate the fact that my pastors disrespect me. I hate, I hate what this is doing to my reputation at the church, my reputation at the workplace. I hate the messy divorce I'm gonna have to go through. I hate what it's gonna do to me and my kids and the long-term relationship. I hate all of these things because I hate all of these things. I'm gonna try to say no to this relationship and go back to my wife. That's not gonna work. Because you didn't stop and decide to love her. You wrap yourself around her. What's this doing to her? See, that's what starts to change things. Stop trying so hard in the Christian life and instead love really hard in the Christian life. That's what starts to change things. Like I've got to love God. Like, like, like when he was doing that to her, do you know how the Holy Spirit was grieved by his actions? The Holy Spirit was grieved about what was going on with his kids. The Holy Spirit was grieved that a Jesus follower would do this thing. Absolutely. Why didn't this absolutely wreck this guy? Same reason it doesn't wreck me sometimes. So Linda and I fight. I know you're shocked. I'll give you a second. So we'll fight. And, and we're not like big and loud about it, but like, like we'll go long times and there's just tension. You ever have that? There's just tension. We're just shorter with each other and we know something's in the room and we're not really calling it out or dealing with it. And it's just there and it goes on for a while. And we've had several, you know, <laughs> of these. And I'm so sorry. I really am. <laughs> My wife's the interpreter, by the way, um, if you don't know. Oh, poor thing. Um, and it's all her fault. Let me explain to you how. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Serious. So... Uh, we'll finally get together and we'll start being honest with each other about what's been going on. And when we finally get together and we start, finally start to talk and we finally kind of humble ourselves with each other, it'll start, one of us will be like, hey, you know, when you did that thing, that made me feel like this. And when it made me feel like this, I got stuck in this emotional place and then I started acting this way. And then the other one would be like, yeah, and then when you started acting this way, that, that made me feel like this, and then I got stuck, and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? And, 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 and a half an hour later, you're dumping all this really good stuff out into the open where you can actually deal with it and talk about it, and it's all of your stuff, right? It's like all of your weakness and your sin, and, and, and all of a sudden you feel lighter, and there's joy, because I'm not bound up in it anymore. We're actually talking about it now. We're actually working on it now. Floodgates open, thank God. You have that? Like that happens, right? And then here's the question. Um, once we got to the discussion and all that great material, she had all that great material, I had all that great material. How do we have all that great material? Where'd the material come from? The Holy Spirit. Because when all the things were actually going down, the Holy Spirit was like, Josh, this. I mean, by the time I got to the big conversation with Linda, I was able to unpack it all. But the Holy Spirit had been telling me. And you're like, well, <laughs> I get some marriage counseling advice for the pastor here. Why didn't you just tell her in the moment? And that way it just would have been dealt with immediately and you wouldn't have had to, yeah, I didn't do that. Why not? Because I didn't want to. 
Why didn't I want to? Because if I had, I would lose power. If I had, I'd be the weak one. If I had shared with her immediately in all those little moments, I'd have had to humble myself. Do you see? I had this whole legal case for how I was right. That's what I love. I like being right. Anybody? Yeah. You see Jesus come in and he's like, how about the thing is actually about, can you wrap your skin around that other person? Can you love them more than you love yourself? Because if I could love her, I could humble myself. If I could love her, I could let go of it. Do you see? It's the secret to all of it, guys. You've tried, you've white knuckled before. You've tried really hard to grow in Christ before and it didn't work for you. And I think Jesus gave us the secret as to why. Is because you were trying hard. You weren't loving hard. I've got to love God better. I've got to love my wife more than I love myself. I got to stop trying to avoid consequences. I've got to stop trying to manage my sin like you're trying to manage your sin. And this is my stuff every day. So you're like, well, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. Oh, yes, you do. The Holy Spirit's whispering it to you like he is to me all the time. He's so good. He's so involved in our lives. We've got to respond to him. Love. And it's everything, right? It's like, well, I've got to try really hard not to drink again. No, no. You've got to try really hard to love your family enough not to pass generational sin down anymore. That's what you've really got to do. And when you're tempted by pornography again, do you know what starts to come into your heart in this way? (laughs) God, every time money goes on a credit card, it it keeps a person in sexual bondage. And that starts to wreck you. If you stay in bondage to your pornography addiction the chances that you're going to pass that addiction on to your kids, how high is that? And you've got to love your kids so much and you've got to love God so much that you trust him. And that's what motivates you to walk away from that stuff. Don't try harder, love harder. It's in all of that stuff, guys. I could go on and on and I won't. Would you guys stand? Last week where we ended was, God, you can have it all. Today where we end is, God, show me how to love you more. Show me how to love others. Let's pray. God, aren't you good? Thank you, Jesus, that (laughs) there you were that day. And someone asked you a question, you sliced right through the human condition for us. What we need you to do right now, Holy Spirit, all across this room with individuals, God, and online as well, Lord, everybody that's watching this on the, on the feed, God, we need your Holy Spirit to come to every single human soul and to diagnose exactly what the things are that are holding them back. And God, we just slice right through those and show them how this teaching applies to them. Show them what your spirit is calling them out of. God, that's a supernatural work. God, I can't do that. Only you can, so Jesus In the name of Jesus, would you do this all across this space? God, you are good and you love us and you want more for us. God, thank you. Christ's name, amen.